Good morning, good afternoon uh, to everybody. Welcome to this joint UNCTAD uh, Asian Development Bank uh, seminar on the challenges around financing um, a transition to a, a, a sustainable and greener future. Um, my name is Richard Kozel Wright. I'm the director of the Division on Globalization and Development Strategies uh, here in Geneva. Um, and my colleagues will be discussing some of the work that we've been doing around this theme. And it's, it's a great pleasure, of course, to, to work with the Asian Development Bank. The challenges that we talk about need to have all minds laser focused on the multiple challenges around uh, a just transition to a more sustainable future. In the case of UNCTAD, in many respects, although we are somewhat new to the environmental challenges, the, the underlying issues that I think we all have to talk about have been long part of the uh, of perspective on development that, that UNCTAD is, is associated with, the kinds of structural and macroeconomic constraints on catch-up growth, which was UNCTAD's uh, raison d'etre from 1964, both constraints, both at the domestic and the, and the international level of, of, of what we think are the basis of a fuller understanding of, of uh, sustainable growth parts. Um, we've always in that context insisted that an integrated perspective on the challenge that looks at the interdependence between trade, finance, technological development is, is the perspective that needs to be developed. And we've always insisted that the structure of the global economy and the workings of the multilateral system um, have never adequately lived up to the expectations of developing countries and indeed have often hindered the prospects for developing countries to uh, fulfill the ambitions of catch-up growth and sustained industrial development um, and, and in that context i know we've we've drawn often on on work that has been undertaken by the asian development bank um, now we have to as as everyone does we've had to accommodate the the challenges around uh, around changing climate um not simply as a constraint but but clearly climate is becoming a major constraint on the development ambitions of developing countries uh, we've seen that shockingly most recently of course in in your region in the case of, of pakistan and the way that will undoubtedly hold back development unless the international community uh, 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 steps in and, and deals with consequences of the recent floods. Um, but, but also we of course want to look at the climate challenge as an opportunity for developing countries to um, find the ways that, that can support uh, their ambitions of, 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 of catch-up growth and, and industrialization. Um, and I think a lot of the work that we've been doing, and Diana and colleagues will talk about in, 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 in their work, I think looks at the climate challenge from, from that perspective. Um, it's, it's part of the, our attempt, I have to say, to catch up to some extent by, by introducing environmental challenges into our work. They have not traditionally been part of the of the UNCTAD mandate, but but, but I think obviously we, we cannot ignore these challenges anymore. Um, we have some complementary work, I think, and, and perhaps colleagues will talk about that, that we've begun uh, with China um, on the in the context of greening the Belt and Road. Um, we're looking at, at, at four Asian countries um, in that context, Turkey, Kazakhstan, Malaysia, and Pakistan, appropriately, I think. Um, and 
we want to try and do similar work in in Latin America and and Africa. We started some projects in the Caribbean region uh, as well. Um, of course, a lot of a lot of how we try and um, pose that analysis is linked to Ungtad's closest close association with the G77. Uh, and therefore, we are also getting much more uh, closely involved in the work of the COP, um, including in obviously in the coming up COP in 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 uh, Sham al Sheikh in November. Uh, particular focus on the financing constraint because we do think that is, and, and uh, for certainly for many developing countries, that is the binding constraint on their industrial ambitions. And, and we will be doing extensive work um, with the Egyptians and beyond on that aspect. And, and I think that will come out strongly in, I hope, in the presentations that we, that we make uh, today. Um, so, so that's hopefully a, a, a brief summary of, of the work that, that we are doing and colleagues will uh, fill in the details, I hope. Um, on, on the value of that work and the potential to contribute to uh, the, the development challenge more generally. So without further ado, I think Catherine will pick up the responsibilities for, for, for the thank seminar. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, thank you for that. Um, so I'd just like to give an overview of the session. So this will start with um, UNCTAD presenting the emerging findings from their research um, in Asia and Pacific on mobilizing resources for a Green New Deal. And we will then have two panels, one to give country perspectives from the Pacific and Indonesia, and one on enabling environments where we will hear from Switch Asia on sustainable consumption and production, and also from the Import Export Bank of China. Um, the final part of the session, we hope, will be an opportunity for discussion, um, but I'll come back to you that uh, I'm on the end. So now um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Diana Barclough from the Globalization and Development Division of UNCTAD and leader of the Green New Deal research um, to start her presentation. Diana. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, thank you to the Asian Development Bank for inviting us and being interested in our work and giving us the chance to share this with you. Um, I, I should say that I'm not the only one responsible for this work and I've had we have uh, quite a big team of people now um, bringing the sustainability concerns of the environment more into the mainstream part of our work, which as Richard has just said to you, was not traditionally something that we did. But now, um, responding to the urgent and pressing demands of climate change and linking them in an integrated way with development, we really have to um, address this in a much more uh, robust way. And this is something that we are attempting to do. Um, as Richard has uh, really sketched out for you very nicely, this, this uh, kind of overview of the UNCTAD message is we really are working very hard to to support the message that transformation, transformation which is essential for the needs of climate change, it is not the same thing as preserving what's already existing. We're trying to transform it into a way that is sustainable and developmental and creates job opportunities and income opportunities and a prosperity path, but at the same time, obviously different from what we have done in the past. So those who focus on transformation and development tend to focus on the kind of things that we will be discussing now. Whereas the other approach is more of a focus on risk management. And uh, that, that is not what we see as the answer. That is about preserving existing assets. It's not developmental. And if we want to be transformative, then public finance is absolutely crucial for that. And um, speaking in an audience of the Asian Development Bank, I know that you'll be very aware of the role of public finance, of public banks, development banks, we see these as absolutely crucial for the heavy lifting that has to be that has to be done. Private finance can do many things and some things very well, but not this. Um, this is the job for the heavy lifting lifting of public banks in partnership with private finance. And at the same time, 
this recognition that we need to have industrial policy to actually guide that finance and to find a demand for the supply of it and to bridge the leap that's required for structural transformation. So these are very big, uh, big needs, big ambitions. And this is how we started this work is after being requested by our member states, our developing country member states, what are the paths that have worked in the past? What lessons can we draw from that from the future? And how do we find a more integrated and sustainable approach? So, the, you know, the climate battle is going to be fought and either lost or won in Asia. Um, Asia has some of the biggest challenges from, with regard to climate change, adaptation and mitigation. But also the encouraging message is that Asia has actually done massive transformation in living history and has had some very successful lessons and successful paths. So, you know, it's very nice to speak to uh, with an audience of people who know this. We don't have to spell it out from the beginning how Asia uh, made this part. Um, so thinking about, you know, what we need to know for the future, what are the developmental lessons that stay the same? Well, this uh, East Asian model of um, structural transformation, which was so successful in bringing millions out of poverty and getting off the path of, of subsistence agriculture into a modern industrialized nation, has five or six things that are common in all the places where it has been successful. A developmental mindset of their leaders, a clear national strategy that charts a path that has um, support from society and from its leaders, a policy approach that has got some regulation where it's needed, but also incentives as carrot. The carrot is not provided forever. The state support is conditioned on performance requirements. And in fact, there's a, an inter, a institutional geometry of reciprocal controls and sharing information. Perhaps even more important, the coherence between the macro and the micro policies, or equally important, you don't have micro policies trying to go in one direction and then with an exchange rate policy or an interest rate policy that is pulling in a different path. And then the overarching idea that finance is an instrument to create and guide credit to these goals. So this was the old, this was the old developmental lesson of the East Asian transformation. What is new about this when we have to bring inside also green transformation? There are some things that are different from the old path. And the first thing, obviously, is that we need new goals of sustainability, as well as the same goals of the last transformation, which was about upgrading and raising incomes. But it's more hard, more hard this time, because there's less policy space this time. We've got international rules and regulations that make things much more difficult. We've got a hyper-financialized world, which makes it more difficult to wield the uh, carrot of credit, and also makes countries more vulnerable to external shocks. So this balance between internal and external finance is more difficult. And my colleague Keith will be addressing that shortly. Also, the sunk assets are huge. Okay, the, the economy is deeply embedded in heavily fossil fuel uh, oriented industries. And there's people as well, millions and millions of people in this sector. So we need to find new ways of dealing with both industrial elites and also the uh, huge numbers of people, working people who are involved in this sector, many of whom, both the elites and the working, the people in you know, lower, lower jobs, want to change. Everyone wants to change in many sectors, but it's difficult and how do they do it? So we're talking about a process of creative destruction, creating new green industrial activities, and at the same time, winding down and destroying incumbent or problematic ones. So this is very complex, how to do it in a developmental and sustainable way. This is why we have started this work. Our member states have asked us for um, advice and research. So the first thing we started to analyze is looking at what are the sources of finance available for this, because obviously this is critical. And looking across the broad landscape of many different sources of finance, from market-based instruments to developmental instruments and banks, uh, really, what stands out very clearly is that the role of public banks is absolutely essential. This is where you get the long-term vision and where you get the ability to follow a different kind of mandate. So we found that the um, green bond market, for example, not as green as one would hope, 
and also, very importantly, often not contingent on performance. When we analysed a vast number of green bond issues, we found that there is not the requirement for performance linked to um, the outcome. Uh, where does this leave us? The lenses for learning. So we started this research, and I said Catherine um, is very kind to describe it as being um, underway. We are in preliminary findings, I would say. So some of our lenses that we've been looking at, the first of all is the lens of what did we learn from the COVID experience? And we find that banks across the world, we interviewed many, many banks across the world, public banks, and all banks were struggling, trying to do their best to meet the unexpected and huge needs of COVID. And there's clear lessons about those that could do the most. And they were well capitalized for a rainy day, they had a clear mandate with strong political support from their governments, and they had a national strategy, which meant that the bank could very quickly provide what was needed. Our country studies, which we started some of them and the others are still in a planning phase, so we're very keen to, um, interested to have your feedback on this. We have country studies on the V20, the Vulnerable 20 group, Korea, Sri Lanka, Fiji, Vietnam, India, or regions of India, Indonesia, and we find across these countries, our preliminary findings, as I say, many countries have got very well-designed policies, backed up by law and backed up by strong political support, but at the same time, facing very big obstacles, often lack of trust between government and the private sector, sometimes lack of institutional memory because government departments are moving, people are moving very fast within departments. It's hard to maintain a clear strategy. The uh, incumbents, obviously, finding it very hard to budge, even when they are state-owned enterprises, not easy to make them transform or encourage them to transform. In the sector studies, we're looking at tourism and energy, palm oil, plastics, fossil fuel transformation, agro-industry. It's a broad list of different sectors that are all aiming to transform and change. And also cross-cutting challenges, particularly the oceans, for example, who is financing? the changes there. On the question of inclusion, Green New Deal, we often forget that it also includes gender because of the new part of the words Green New Deal. So our studies in Sri Lanka and Indonesia have shown with very interesting results where there's uh, no or very little structural transformation in either countries, even though there's increased productivity within these sectors. And in both of these countries, women are concentrated in the very low productivity sectors, and they will be potentially adversely impacted with green policies that aim to raise, um, raise productivity, but do not create a place or sensitivity to gender equality. So we've got a lot of very uh, interesting and competing and important areas where we're looking for new, new answers and information to guide policy. Having said that, Given that we now see how important the public banks are, research that we've done for this year's TDR is showing that the heavy lifting of regional development banks is small compared to the bilateral flows globally. And this is a trend that's been going for some years. It's not a new trend, but I think it's a, a concerning trend and something to watch out for, given that um, the regional development banks really pushed the boat out in many parts of the world to deal with COVID and also that now the bilateral flows may well be impacted if there's a reduction in this year, given what is happening in the global economy. So important message is that we're relying on regional development banks, but do they have that support, that capitalization, that policy space from their member states, from their owners? It's a, one of our major findings. A second area that we were looking at, as I mentioned, is how to deal with these very difficult to transform structures and sectors. Now, the fossil fuels industry, there's a large number of people researching the um, different paths for moving out of fossil fuels, particularly energy. One that um, UNCTAD has got some plastic, which I think people maybe have underestimated the degree to which Asian countries are highly exposed and dependent on plastics imports and exports. These are fossil fuels, of course, so countries that can make alternatives and substitutes for these products will be in a good space for creating new markets. And those that continue to rely on the plastics industry 
will find um, you know that life gets more difficult I, I anticipate if the reliance on plastic can be over 15 percent for some countries in this region so very important and it's in every level of the value chain now why do i mention plastic is that one of the big things is that of course it has a very high concentration of the carbon footprint but the other is that there's a very high concentration of uh, private finance in the petrochemical, particularly petrochemical finance. And it's a, a lens through which we can look and see what's the opportunities for changing and having a greener finance. And what we do see is that a um, very small proportion of state finance still in this area. Um, it's actually quite important to have that because they will be the ones that fund transition of the private finance of the tens of thousands of bonds, only a handful are green finance. And then thinking about the oceans, as I mentioned, another prospect where we really need to have support from public banks because the activities that provide conservation or uh, sustainability of the oceans are covered by ODA. And that's an absolute drop in the ocean, $1.8 billion out of assets and trade that are measured in the 24 trillion. So assets measured at 24 trillion, trade according to UNCTAD database, um, almost $3 trillion. And yet the finance for supporting the green aspects of this is absolutely minimal. So as Richard mentioned at the beginning, to bring all of these things together, to bring all of these things together, we need not only finance, finance is important, but we need not only finance, we need to have industrial policies and social policies that create a broad acceptance and support for these um, massive transformation. So as I said, we are at the start of this research. We have two or three country studies well developed and the others are still in a uh, research form. We have sector studies that are making some progress and I look forward to giving you some feedback from that um, in the near future. Uh, that's, I will close now and hand over to my next speaker. Keith. Thank you, Diana. Uh, good morning or good day to everyone. I'm joining you from South Africa and we have um, uh, unstable electricity supply. So hopefully um, the images and things will um, continue to be clear. Um, I, what I'm doing is, is taking the approach of looking at the sustainability of finance um, both externally and in the public se sector context, and then um, using some examples from Asian countries, applying what we call the sustainable development framework assessment um, to see whether or what the potential implications for particular countries might be when you start adding um, a green agenda financing obligations to um, existing commitments or other commitments that might relate, for example, to um, sus sustainable development goals. So I'm going to share my screen and, and do a quick presentation. Okay. Um, so we're looking at assessing financial sustainability of the green economy initiatives and their implications for trade and industrial policy. Uh, the, the trade and industrial policy implications will be relatively high level because I think each country has specific issues that need to be dealt with. All right, so just for those of you who don't know what the Sustainable Development Framework Assessment is, um, it essentially has three elements. So the first is uh, focused on the external constraint. And in essence, what we, we're looking at here is um, the sustainability of external finances, which is particularly important in the case of many low income and less developed countries. In this particular case, I'm just showing you the examples of the historic data from Indonesia. Um, and essentially what we're looking at is the, the ratio of the current account balance, but it's augmented. So we focus specifically on uh, exports plus remittances. 
And then we look at the, um, the, the ratio of that um, net external liabilities to those augmented exports. The important thing here is that the area of financial sustainability is ultimately determined by the relative growth rates of uh, ex augmented exports and in this case, the net, uh, the, the average cost of net external liabilities. So the boundary condition, that yellow line you see actually uh, is determined by that sort of interplay between the growth of augmented exports and net external liabilities. And from a policy perspective, what you'd wa be wanting to do is increase the area of external financial sustainability and then that will give you greater policy space to, to work with. The second element is the public sector constraint. So here we look at essentially the fiscal balance as a share of GDP and uh, the ratio of public sector net liabilities to the GDP. Again, in this case, we're using Indonesia as an example. So the red lines are showing both a um, legislative constraints, um, there's a deficit limit in terms of fiscal rules, and then a debt limit. Um, and you can see in this particular case, the area of public sector financial sustainability is um, has a positive gradient, which effectively means that the rate of growth in the GDP is actually higher than the average cost of the public sector net liabilities. The third element of the SDFA is an integration of these two previous constraints. So it essentially shows the same information as the public sector constraint. But what happens now is that we we don't take the growth of GDP, the actual growth, we look at what rate of growth would be sustainable um, in terms of external uh, finances. Um, and in this case, you can see that the gradient of the boundary condition is actually lower than the uh, middle graph, the public sector constraint. And that basically uh, means that the sustainable growth rate is lower than the actual growth rate that was experienced over the, uh, we essentially here, we're focusing on the period from 2010 to 2019. Okay, so if we take the performance in relation to some of these key interplay variables, the, essentially those that determine the boundary conditions and the area of external sustainability. Then in the case of Fiji, we see that augmented exports grew at a slower rate than the cost of net external liabilities. In Sri Lanka, interestingly, augmented exports grew at a quite a, a faster rate than the cost of net external liabilities. And in Indonesia's case, again, augmented exports grew at a slower, slower rate. So we could say that over the period that we are focused on, which in this case, 2010 to 2019, um, Fiji was becoming less externally sustainable, and so was Indonesia. If we then look at the public sector sustainability, here we see that uh, Fiji had growth that was higher than the average cost of public sector net liabilities, um, but Sri Lanka did not. Indonesia also had, had uh, higher um, growth in GDP than the, the, the cost of their public sector net liabilities. So in this instance, from a public sector financial sustainability perspective, Sri Lanka was becoming less sustainable over this period. And we know what has happened in, uh, in more recent times as well. And then when we integrate uh, the two components and look at what is what rate of growth is externally sustainable, then we see that um, Sri Lanka has a growth rate that is way lower than the average cost of their public sector net liabilities. Indonesia is in a relatively sound position uh, over this period at least. Fiji effectively has uh, a higher rate of growth in, in um, externally sustainable uh, growth rate, but it's actually pointing to uh, the need for contraction to be externally sustainable. 
Okay, so if we just take two country examples, in this case, I'm using Indonesia. So we've got a starting or historical position that covers the period from 2010 to 2021. And then uh, we're projecting what would happen if you uh, made certain assumptions. And uh, these assumptions are particularly around uh, spending on sustainable development goals one to four. And then I've added an extra 2% of GDP um, to meet green agenda objectives by 2031. Now, I've just, the 2% is I've just taken out of the air because I haven't managed to source any studies that really uh, quantify what the costs would be. Um, the 3.7% is an estimate done by UNCTAD staff members on what Indonesia would need to spend in addition to current government spending in order to achieve sustainable development goals one to four. Um, I've also in this instance made the assumption that if Indonesia was to invest in this way, there would be a 2% reduction in their import uh, propensity between now and 2031. Um, so, you, But what you can see then is that the financial projections going up to 2031, so those, those numbers reflect the years um, moving forward, take us to much higher levels of, of um, fiscal deficits in effect. And um, they also take us to, to much higher uh, debt to GDP ratios. So in, in Indonesia's case, they would exceed their um, debt to GDP ratio almost double um, what, what it currently is legislated at. If we take a Sri Lankan example, we see a situation that's fairly similar, except now you can see Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka's case, their area of financial sustainability is actually shrinking with time. Um, so that's because their growth rate is, is um, the externally sustainable growth rate is not um, higher than the cost of their public sector finances. Um, but in this case, you can see that if you if you make similar assumptions, uh, in Sri Lanka's case, they would need to spend an additional 4.5% of GDP to achieve their SDG 1 to 4 goals. Um, but if we assume an, also another 2% on top of that for, green, for the green agenda, then that would take them to somewhere in the order of um, in excess of 250% debt to GDP ratio and their uh, fiscal deficits would effectively be running at around 18%. Clearly those things are not, or this is not what you would regard as sustainable. So the question then is what policy responses could we have that would uh, start to try to increase the policy space, um, but which would also help in the context of, of the, the green agenda. So, to put it crudely, the first objective from an external perspective would be to reduce import propensity and or raise export propensity. So I think in one sense, there is some alignment with the green agenda. If you just look at these three countries, their dependence on oil imports. Um, so the top right-hand graph um, in, in all three countries, uh, oil imports are the largest single element of their merchandise trade. And um, so in Fiji's case, uh, on average over the last five years, it made up about 19% of their imports. In Sri Lanka's case, 17% and Indonesia slightly lower than that. But combined, they were importing around $33 billion worth of uh, fuel or, or, uh, and, and oil in 2021. So if you think about reducing import propensity to the extent that the green agenda is able to reduce the, the dependence on those oil imports, it will help to achieve uh, external financial sustainability. Of course, what we don't know is what kind of um, capital equip equipment and other imports would be required to fund that or, uh, or to facilitate that, that shift away from energy dependence. Second element is around export diversification. 
effectively focusing on uh, products with revealed competitiveness and also moving away from those products that um, are, co are contracting in global markets or will be contracting. So as uh, uh, Diana pointed out, uh, in the context of the plastic sector, um, there are products that we hope in the context of the green agenda will start to be in decline. Um, in this case, we just look at Sri Lanka's uh, example, uh, uh, an analysis of their trade position between 2015 and 2020. Um, a very significant portion of Sri Lanka's exports are actually in contracting global markets. And so to the extent that you want to try and align trade policy uh, with the green agenda, what you would be wanting to do is, is move out of those industries that are in uh, structurally uh, or structural decline and hopefully replace them with uh, new products that are consistent with the green agenda. There's obviously also scope in the context of, pub of uh, public sector financing for supportive infrastructure that will facilitate higher export growth. So uh, transport, um, uh, communication infrastructure is obviously important, but you want to think of it from the lens of how do we invest in a way that will facilitate higher export growth. And then um, facilitating access to foreign markets by new exporters um, is also an area that, that can receive some attention. On the, on the, in the context of the net external liabilities and their average cost, I think one of the things that is important is to change perspectives on foreign investment. So while foreign investment does, uh, at the time of the initial investment, contribute to um, financial sustainability, what we have seen with these countries is that on the primary income account, the outflows subsequently are much more significant than the any inflows into the primary income account. And this effectively is pointing to the fact that that foreign investment is expensive. It, it uh, carries a relatively high cost. Um, if we look at the public sector financial sustainability, I think the, the key issues here is that we want to adopt policies that raise the rate of, of economic growth that's externally sustainable. Now, uh, that links in the most part to the previous discussion, but I think there are also elements involved in uh, improving the efficiencies of tax collection systems and improving the effectiveness of government programs. It goes without saying. Um, the top graph here is just highlighting the, the um, government revenue to GDP ratios of these three countries. And you can see for the most part, they've been trending lower um, in some cases, that has been as a consequence of particular policy design, but in other cases, it also points to uh, gaps in the efficiencies of their tax collection systems. And then lastly, uh, seeking to reduce the average cost of public sector net liabilities, there is scope for debt restructuring. Um, and I think particularly in a country like Sri Lanka, for example, there's also scope for reducing reliance on external financing. But it is interesting to me that the uh, both Fiji and Sri Lanka, the average real cost of their public sector borrowings is, is negative and relatively low. Um, I was surprised by how low it is. And in fact, despite Indonesia's relatively uh, more stable and financially sustainable performance, its public sector borrowing costs were actually slightly higher than, uh, than those other two countries. So hopefully that's given us a bit of food for thought and uh, will stimulate some discussion. And I'm happy to conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. That was really very, very interesting. Um, I think that um, there's a lot of uh, scope here for countries to really think about these you know these could these constraints but also these opportunities that as you've shown some of these opportunities are you know maybe a bit um haven't been haven't been given a significant priority before so it's very very helpful to have your insights on that um catherine has asked me to move straight on to the next panel because we are a short of time um so i'm going to do that uh, forthwith i'm now introducing 
our spe next speaker, Carlos Lee Morrissey, who is uh, the Program Advisor and Resilient Development Finance for the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat. And uh, from Tuvalu, before that he has been um, in charge of the Tuvalu Trust Fund and has a great deal of experience in this sector. So Carlos, uh, five minutes over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Diane, and really thank you, uh, Keith, for the really very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, I'm going to speak specifically around the experiences in the Pacific and more generally around the interlinkages between climate financing and development financing. So in terms of uh, in the Pacific, the reality is like the, the challenge uh, you always hear is about access to climate finance. And if you look, I, I don't really I want to do a presentation, I only have five minutes, but most people will understand that the architecture for access and climate finance it really the, the starting point is really the same donors uh you have the, the double countries uh, providing financing to the for example the green climate fund but also the same donors are also pri pr providing financing to the uh multilateral and also uh, uh regional development banks but there are also bilateral flows now within within their construct and that uh, um, governance structure or rather the accessibility structure there is the climate financing aspect, but there's also the development financing aspect. For small island countries with very small uh, finance administrations, the access criteria and qualifications requirements normally need to be linked to some sort of higher level uh, strategic goals uh, related to the SDGs and more generally the national development plans. But because of the push, we've, we've had this push for climate finance uh, action. Uh, there's also a requirement to specific climate um, action plans, we have the national adaptation plans, and those become the, the, the criteria of assessment for access to climate finance. What we are suggesting and what we have done, we have uh, advised our uh, member countries to try and integrate this climate finance uh, into the development agenda, into the development financing uh, pot, so to speak. Uh, one of the issues really around when you have the uh, implementation through sectors and through uh, the different plans, is you have the problem of integration. And the way we have tried to, to, to deal with this is actually through um, positioning resilience and climate finance departments within central agencies like the ministries of finance and also links. So in most uh, Pacific Island countries, you have the Ministry of Finance who are also responsible for managing aid flows. And by centralizing this position, these uh, departments, you have the, the real chance of integration through the planning process, through the budgeting process, and also through the monitoring and evaluation processes. So that way, um, there is a question. We, we did a paper uh, last year around climate finance effectiveness. And when we had it sitting outside the ministries of finance, it's really, really hard to track uh, one, the flows, and two, to measure the actual effectiveness. Uh, as we transition into more, more green economies um, and with climate finance and also the resilience, there's a big uh, discussions around disaster risk financing related to the uh, the negative impacts of disasters on, on developments in the region that you find that uh, it's i think it is time now that we actually integrate and make it more a discussion around climate risk and disaster risk informed development and then the financing flows in the, the extra aspect uh, related to the actual climate elements of it becomes a premium on the development financing flows rather than a separate part of uh, of, of money on financing um, and for small island development states with very small administrations, the, uh, the, the excess and the approaches, you start actually thinning out the capacity of, of, of countries to implement. Um, and then the question of obviously of uh, how do we actually advance or step up and do transformation, transformational uh, development changes and improvements is really around, um, rather than talking of climate finance, it's outside of the development uh, space that it, the first point of course should be by development because ultimately the, the also if you look at the uh, the financial preferences even though there's a big flow into into climate finance per se the the majority of the preferences is still development ODA is still the primary uh, source of funding for for our member countries and now we're also talking about uh, some of the countries the bilaterals are also discussing budget support with an element of monitoring that's related to how much of their support is actually going towards climate financing, or rather, as I mentioned before, the climate finance premium of development. 
the, that aspect has to be uh, a major part of the discussion and also has the parallel um, elements of actually being able to track what countries are actually doing in terms of their uh, obligations under the SDGs, the ob obligations under the, uh, uh, the international climate financing, uh, or rather climate uh, change uh, agreements and declarations. If it's factored into the whole development space, then I think that the progress will be measured in terms of development rather than in terms of primarily what he what, what's the climate finance investment. If it's primarily judged on the development investments, then you can factor in an element which is climate related. Uh, I think uh, Diane's uh, presentation right at the start spoke about the green bonds and the blue bonds. Uh, the Pacific, we have tried, uh, a few countries have implemented those or have uh, uh, issued green bonds, but the uh, effectiveness is yet to be uh, uh, really fully assessed. Uh, noting that the absorptive capacity is also challenging. Uh, in conclusion, I think I just want to add that uh, for a long time, the climate finance is now almost a mainstream discussion. And we feel that it's actually time that it doesn't sit outside. When you start talking about excess of climate finance and disaster risk financing, you actually start creating silos in the way it's operationalized nationally. But we want to get away from that. We want to get further integration. And then putting that financing is actually part of the ODA. I'll step, stop there for now, uh, Diane, in uh, noting the interest of time and give the opportunity to other panelists, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, Carlos, thank you so much. That was really, really very, very interesting indeed. Um, I think I noticed particularly your your comment that the funds are mostly coming through through ADI, ADA, ODA, and bilaterals, and that's very important uh, finding in terms of what this means for the development banks that have more uh, regular or transparent uh, mechanism of operating. Um, can I turn to, uh, we can have more discussion on this once uh, Butch has also spoken. Um, if I can introduce, uh, I said Butch, Manuel Montes, who is um, joining us from uh, New York. Uh, Manuel is now the Senior Advisor for the Society of International Development, but before that he was also the Chief of Policy Analysis at UNDESA on the development branch for financing of development. Um, so Butch, if I can turn to you, please. Uh, thanks, uh, Diana. I'm happy to have the privilege to speak about uh, what I'm doing uh, for the project, and I'm happy to be part of this project. Um, uh, it is just the start of the research, and maybe there I, I can uh, elicit some comments and suggestions from people. I have an excellent uh, partner in Indonesia working with INDEF, uh, but uh, I, uh, you know, I'm responsible for this presentation. We didn't have enough time to, to uh, consult with each other, right? Uh, so basically, the, may I share my screen, right? Uh, let me just uh, put on the, the screen. And uh, these are the main points. And the main thing is that uh, climate action in Indonesia must be part of a national development effort. And I think the Indonesian discussion is very much uh, uh, in line with this, with this kind of view, right? Uh, Indonesia is the world's largest exporter of coal and coal is responsible for 60% of its electricity. They, have, they, were, they are planning to reach 23% uh, dependence on renewables by 2025, but right now they're only at 12%. Indonesia is also the largest palm oil producer and exporter. Uh, it contributes 11% of exports uh, and employs 4 million people, uh, with 11 million people dependent on it. But the palm oil industry is associated with what is called technically the Nuru CF, land use, land use change emissions. And at present, uh, these emissions constitute a very large part of the uh, emissions of Indonesia. So it's really part of the uh, structural transformation, climate action uh, uh, challenge of Indonesia, in, which has 10% of the world's tropical rainforest and 36% of its peatlands, right? And the most diverse mangroves, which it needs for uh, flood control in the future, right? So it is a large role as a, uh, uh, as a, uh, uh, I, I think, a net sink in the world, right? So let me share the screen, uh, hang on. So 
this is this just shows you that the the immediate challenge until 2030 for Indonesia is to figure out a way to transition the palm oil uh, industry, right? Uh, of course, by 2050, the emissions from energy supply the Indonesia continues to develop will be overtake the contribution from the palm oil industry to emissions, right? Uh, uh, Indonesians are very active in UNFCCC and they they consider this uh, part of their national plan. And they, they, they all, a lot of Indonesians that you talk with also understand that their own, I wish they, they wish they could contribute more uh, globally to this uh, climate effort, right? But climate transition will be costly in terms of economic, social, and environmental costs. In the last few days, we saw how knife edge the UK budget is. And uh, Keith's uh, uh, presentation shows that uh, there are really public sector constraints, right? Uh, in the case of Indonesia, the, the cost of decommissioning, state revenue losses from uh, climate action, livelihood diversification and protection, the acquisition of technology, plus the resistance of property owners and incumbents and wealthy actors wedded to fossil fuel industry is part of the uh, social effort domestically. But many actions relating to the strengthening and, and modernizing of the palm oil sector, for example, will have direct benefits to ordinary citizens. For example, improvements in the technology of palm oil, making it more efficient, uh, land, use, land use rehabilitation and maintenance, which absorbs labor and uh, can be used to upgrade the capabilities, right? So, the, uh, the Indonesia is also very ambitious plans to uh, for renewable energy transition, including the early retirement of coal-fired plants, which I think the ADB is uh, has a mechanism that, that that is supporting it. Right. So this is the ambitious goal of Indonesia for a. You can see here, but by 2050, no more coal. Right. But we I, I said in the beginning that uh, Indonesia is the largest single coal exporter. So it, it actually creates a, uh, uh, you know, a, a very large challenge for Indonesia. There is also domestically a, a growing discussion about uh, domestic electric vehicles uh, production, including uh, battery production. Now, Indonesia is, uh, has one fourth of the nickel resources of the world, right? Uh, uh, so moving on to the last part of the last few parts of the session, so what is needed for the transition? Well, I say two things. And in effect, part of this is part of the discussion that uh, Keith has discussed, uh, has talked about, uh, steady economic growth in the long run and stable financing flows that are within the debt carrying capacity of Indonesia. Financing a, a climate transition in a, in a BOP constrained development pathways, not very, this is the, 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 the the model that this project uses, which is actually very little uh, taught in uh, our economics schools, right? Now, part of the problem, and this is uh, implicit in what Keith uh, talked about, is that uh, typically the balance sheets of developing countries provide a limit to how much debt absorption a country can can uh, can absorb, right? So even if, for example, uh, as he said that the Maybe Fiji and Sri Lanka have very low cost of uh, borrowing, even if external financing is uh, available. There is a limit to how much uh, can be, uh, uh, how much uh, debt can can actually be uh, 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 absorbed by the country. Right? Uh, before and the example is this: let's say if take uh, going at the, on the. Uh, 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 palm oil industry uh, uh, example, right? Uh, if before 2030, the most immediate potential for emission reduction in Indonesia, and this is, uh, you know, uh, calculated by the by, by uh, Indonesian studies, it's an effective and extended forest moratorium, then it will require, actually what it means is that it financing that usually stimulated by private investment, you know, uh, voluntarily coming in from forest clearing will be lost. And private financing has to be replaced by public financing for protecting and diversifying households, 
improving the technology of smallholder farming, reforestation, resilient infrastructure investment, controlling peat fires, and so on. In many ways, climate transition and structural transformation in Indonesia is a defensive uh, dimension. It means uh, take, uh, putting some uh, putting attention to food, food and land use uh, uh, as the sector. And also it's a question of uh, what, what happens to the exports, right? Uh, can India and China be continue counted on to be the uh, importers of Indonesia's coal exports? How can these exports be replaced? What kind of programs will have to be financed from public finances for, for that kind of thing? Can palm oil export, and Indonesia is the biggest palm oil exporter, can it be replaced? Or can it continue to be counted on in the transition to a sustainable economy? And finally, just a few points about uh, what I consider to be important for climate financing. A lot of this shares uh, a lot of characteristics with respect to development financing, right? So one is to, to ensure that uh, domestic investors and domestic beneficiaries of climate investment can undertake such investment at a reasonable cost and with a reasonable return, right? Uh, and number two is to make sure that the non-resident beneficiaries of climate investment, which means the external partners of, the, of Indonesia, bear their share of the cost of climate investments. And this, you know, there, there are lots of proposals on this, matching grants, guarantees, SDR sourced uh, financing. And of course, there's a lot of things to be worked on domestically, like uh, uh, in strengthening the tax system, development bank, and all, but I will not go into that, right? But uh, let me stop here, and that's my, you know, this is the beginning of my research and I look forward to comments. Thank you very much. Thanks, Diana. Thank you, Butch. Thank you. That was a great, another really fascinating presentation. Thank you. Um, so to to keep us on time, because we are um, a, bit, uh, a bit behind time, I'm afraid, but I can't leave these two speakers without having um, some extra discussion, just very briefly. Um, one of the things that I'm picking up from both Carlos and uh, Butcher's uh, presentation is this need for stable and sufficient flows of finance. And um, Carlos, I'm wondering if you can say something. How how do you see the role of of um, of multilateral development banks in this process? I know this is something that um, you've mentioned in the chat, but this uh, this role of this in terms of providing that kind of finance, which is which is needed. Yeah, th thank you very much for the question. In, in fact, I, I didn't mention it in my in my presentation, but even though I wanted to, uh, but noting that we are talking to a development bank <laughs> who very well knows their role. Uh, by the way, also I was at one stage I was Secretary of Finance in Tuvalu, and uh, um, really, regardless of the size of the the magnitude of the administration, the issues are the same. So in terms of the role of development banks, I see them as playing a crucial role. First of all, in terms of uh, streamlining the excess modalities, uh, just really based on tried and tested. Um, uh, modalities that they've tried in the past and they have also had the opportunity to to, uh, to do incremental uh, improvements over time and they're probably I find them more uh, responsive to country needs versus the bilateral the bilateral discussions uh, usually takes time to actually for the government the recipients and uh, donor governments to agree one on the modality of transfers and two also on the actual policy because most of them actually link to some sort of policy um, actions and then usually takes a long time to 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 come to uh, uh, an agreement uh also uh the the, the multi-development banks are actually uh, i see their roles as one of the drivers or influences of development agendas um and, and aligning it because they're dealing across multi uh, administrations multi uh, countries they have the opportunity to actually transfer knowledge and lessons learned from other countries in terms of how they're implementing. Uh, there, there is a question around the absorptive capacity, but I think there's probably a lesser uh, uh, element. I'm not saying it's not important, but it can be dealt with in terms of capacity supplementation. Uh, whereas development banks usually do the, the mobilization of financing, but they also are really very good to do the monitoring and evaluation of the development impacts. And I think that's, that's important so that we can actually get a, a gauge of the uh, the effectiveness uh, of the development aid mm -hmm. in terms of reaching the development targets and goals. Thank you. Thank you. 
it's that um that point that you just made strikes me that because one of the lessons that that Unct had learned from our studies of the um, the original East Asian transformation is this importance of these reciprocal controls where you can actually see that there has been a performance that was intended or promised and link that with the continued provision of the incentives and not that um, these are not that they should, I mean there should still be room for flexibility and for some mistake making or some time to adapt but as you say that's absolutely important to have that information. Um, if I can just um, ask uh, Butch a question, um, you were talking, you gave the example, Butch, of the palm exports. I mean, this as a very kind of practical sectoral example now. Um, you know, how how will palm oil be replaced? I mean, what we see in Europe is that increasing regulations against it. This is getting a bit to the trade issue that Katie will address. Um, but it will the uh, market for palm oil is I don't know how it is at the moment, but presumably in the future there will be less market for it, less demand. How will Indonesia make that leap? Well, uh, right now, uh, Indonesia is actually, uh, I mean, just two months ago, they had a big uh, controversy in Indonesia because they, they also have a biodiesel program uh, in Indonesia, right? I mean, this is the kind of thing where you where you mix the fossil fuel with the biodiesel, right? So, but then they uh, cooking oil prices uh, went up. So even domestically, it is actually uh, the palm oil is an issue and they're very conscious, Indonesia very conscious that uh, the exports are not going to be, uh, uh, you know, are not uh, guaranteed uh, in the long run, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So this is why there's a very strong uh, push for uh, making sure that palm oil is uh, produced efficiently in the, in the best technology and with the uh, you know, with the with the best, uh, you know, with, at the lowest cost, right, to uh, to to the environment. The way it is, uh, uh, the way palm oil uh, uh, projects are now financed is through an export tax. And Indonesia is a country that has pioneered and very famous about export uh, taxes, right? So export taxes actually. Uh, Indonesia has walked into a, quite a few international, uh, a, a few, some, some international uh, uh, controversies uh, because of its use of export taxes. The problem is uh, U.S. style uh, uh, trade, uh, 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 you know, trade agreements uh, prohibit export taxes, right? Um, even on the nickel thing, uh, the Indonesians are saying, well, you know, we can finance this, and this is, in a sense, becoming by doing by using export tax, you're less dependent on the international uh, financing, right? Uh, 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 a lot of uh, in the WTO, uh, export taxes are not yet uh, are not yet prohibited. But of course, since the pandemic, there has been a a discussion in the WTO about uh, uh, disciplining. Uh, 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 disciplining these kinds of bans and export taxes, right? But Indonesia has been very, very uh, uh, creative about doing export taxes, and this is how now now they this this is how they finance the palm oil transition, right? And the palm oil uh, mm -hmm. reforms, right? So this is uh, this is something they are doing, and uh, uh, in a sense, you could say that th there might be enough uh, if they can transition faster, right? This is the problem, right? If they can transition faster, and we know that biodiesel is a very controversial kind of, a, of an issue, right? If they can transition faster, then maybe they won't need so much exports from uh, thing. But mm -hmm. of course, Indonesia is a very, also a very uh, idiosyncratic uh, in terms of oil imports, right? Uh, what Indonesia does is fossil fuel, you know, uh, uh, crude oil, it exports high quality uh, uh, oil and it imports low quality oil for its domestic use for for mm -hmm. gasoline and for uh, uh, for for household uh, uses right so this is a uh, part of the issue maybe that kind of export you know the, the not the coal right but the fossil the the uh, the oil exports might uh, last uh, for a while right 
But the coal exports is again another kind of thing where they have to figure out a way to diversify against it uh, in the in the in the years until 2060. Right? Thanks, Diana. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both speakers. That was really excellent. Um, I'm going to give us back to Catherine now, who will pick up the reins again. Thank you very much uh, for that perspective. Um, now for the final bit of the session, I would like to introduce uh, three, our second panel, um, who will consider a bit more opportunities um, in industrial and trade policies. Um, so our first contributor is Zenaida Farida, who is the team leader for the sustainable consumption and production facility of Switch Asia which um, started in 2007, Switch Asia supports the transition of Asian countries to low carbon resource efficient and circular economy pathways. Um, and then with China as the world's leading exporter, um, I'm delighted that we will have a perspective from Dr. Wen Kai Zhang um, from the Import Export Bank of China. Dr. Zhang will be known to many in ADB, having served as vice president between 2013 and 2018. And then finally, we will have a perspective from Katie Globry-Swan from UNCTAD, and Katie is experienced in how trade, development, finance, and climate policy can enable a global just transition, and we'll discuss challenges and opportunities for development finance institutions. So Zenaida, if I can ask you to speak first. Thank you very much, Catherine. Good morning or afternoon, colleagues. And let me put us a little bit in the context of EU policies and their significance for Asia and uh, trade topic. Uh, Asia, of course, because the work I'm doing is mainly happened in Asia. And in general, the European Union is, of course, we all know, is the largest trader of agricultural and manufacturing goods and services. And uh, what is important, uh, along with trade, it is the largest of international investors. Well, some figures speak for themselves according to the uh, Eurostat data of 2021, uh, approximately 44% of EU imports came from Asia. And the European development is governed today, as we, many of us know, by the Green Deal, which offers a new economic development models. And it really aims at transition towards climate neutral, environmentally sustainable, resource efficient economy with a goal to reach there by 20, uh, 2050. What does it mean really? It means that EU actions, multilateral, bilateral, translate principles behind Green Deal into various policies imp impacting supply chain and also policies related to trade. Let me highlight just a few examples related to different sectors to just indicate the implications which we, we are facing now or will be facing in the future. In the agri-food sector, EU proposes um, agri-food sustainability in multilateral setups already, and those multilateral setups are WTO, G20, and also AFO Codex, and this is an um, entity where standards for trade are being set. Green Deal um, impacts discussions of ethical, environmental, and labor considerations and uh, it, it applies to production standards to imports. Uh, they, are, they are very large measures to address global challenges. EU, uh, for example, pr proposals on deforestation and for carbon border uh, adjustment mechanisms are very known already. And this last mechanism, carbon border uh, adjustment or CBA mechanism, aims at preventing the leak of carbon leakages while ensuring, of course, uh, compatibility with WHO. And it means that non-EU producer would have to pay a price for the carbon used in the production of the goods that are to be imported in the EU. Or the other way around, the EU importers will buy carbon certificates, uh, carboning the carbon price that is to be paid. Would these goods be produced under the um, EU carbon pricing rules. So another interesting uh, implication would come from the uh, from the European um, from the um, sustainable product initiative, uh, which is part of the legislation under under the Green Deal. So this legislation is there to see ensure the products uh, on the EU markets are produced with less waste and em and emission, and of course. Uh, that um, they are more energy resource efficient, they're durable, they're reusable, they're repairable. 
And interestingly, it puts for a producer's responsibility also across this whole supply chain of the product. As implication, and this is, uh, Catherine, you ask me to think about when, uh, when you ask me to interfere. Implications there is a product that are, for example, single used, uh, difficult to recycle or impossible to recycle, will face additional costs in the European market. And vice versa, uh, those which are corresponding to standards uh, of circular economy will benefit from financial, uh, financial incentives. And their eco-design eco requirements would be uh, very much present and expectations are that the products with higher potential for circularity and high climate or environmental footprint would be expected first to respond to circular economy requirements. Among those would be textile and furniture, uh, lubricants, iron, steel, aluminum. Other important uh, requirements would be coming from the fark, uh, fa farm to fork uh, strategies, uh, textile st strategies, and many more would be coming. Um, another interesting uh, note probably to take there that European Commission also aims at the reforms that strengthen WTO contribution to sustainable development. And it already launches negotiations to uh, reinforce rules to avoid distortions of competition due to uh, state uh, intervention. So actions would be there through, for example, uh, attention to making supply chains responsible. And uh, there is a proposal on mandatory due diligence, including effective actions and enforcement. And before these legal requirements are kicking in, the Commission, the European Commission will be providing guidance to EU businesses and across them trickling across the supply chain, these requirements will come on how to comply with international due diligence guidelines and principles. And just to conclude, uh, there will be regulat regulatory standards facilitating transformation towards circular economy. Important thing to note also with sort of bow to uh, Carlos's note that different aspects uh, of development, including climate and uh, other aspects of development need to be sort of taken together. Uh, it means that all of those elements need to be sort of packed, adjusted and aligned and exporting into EU for businesses would have businesses would have to pay more attention on the ways they, so they source materials they produce and how they design their products. There also would be um, a need to disclose more information on all those aspects. And probably, uh, Katrina, if I have half a, uh, half a minute um, to highlight also what is the role in this whole large game of Switch Asia program, which I uh, I represent. Uh, we work from two perspectives. Uh, on, on the one hand, it is through grant projects, which are multi-year, multi-million funding. It facilitates testing and upscaling sustainable industrial productions, particularly with focus on MSMEs and SMEs, promoting greener products and more sustainable consumption in Asia. On the other hand, what we do, we try to take the learnings uh, into the second element of our work, which is policy support component. And this component aims at the creating enabling conditions for uh, mainstreaming and uptaking of those innovations uh, that are uh, piloted uh, by the grants. Uh, let me finish here. Thank you. Great, thank you so much uh, for covering a lot of ground very quickly, uh, Zaneda. Um, if I can now ask Dr. Uh, Wenkai to uh, speak, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Catherine. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, good uh, afternoon or good morning, I should say to you all. It uh, gives me a great pleasure to join you and speak at uh, today's event on behalf of China Exim Bank. Taking this opportunity, I would like to share with you uh, the progress made by China Exim Bank uh, in promoting green finance and my uh, views on how the financial measures can be utilized to support uh, green development. Uh, China Exim Bank adopted its green uh, credit policy as early as 2007. And since then, we have been working actively to support uh, quality and uh, effectiveness of green development. Uh, guided by the green credit policy, uh, we keep expanding the scale of the credit, green credit. We stay committed to increasing our green credit supply to green, low carbon, and environmental 
uh, friendly projects, both at uh, home and abroad. We made a good use of uh, equity investment. Uh, funds initiated or set up by China Exim Bank have supported equity investment projects in countries including uh, Poland, Czech, Hungary, Thailand, Brazil, and nearly 40% of those projects covered uh, fuel or clean energy. We encourage uh, financial market business. We have uh, issued green financial bonds uh, for global investors, uh, adding more uh, varieties to the bond market, uh, raising uh, more specific funds for the green development related projects. We conduct extensive interbank co uh, cooperation. We have uh, uh, conducted a third party market cooperation with uh, uh, Silk Road Fund, the IFC of the World Bank Group, and established on lending cooperative mechanism with the NDB, a new development bank, as you know that, the AIB, uh, KFW, and the EIB, you know, be to the fourth scenery in promoting uh, green uh, development. We participate in green development initiatives in an uh, active way. We have signed with other financial institutions, agreement and initiative supporting green uh, uh, investment, carbon peaking and carbon neutrality goals, and biodiversity conservation to strengthen the environmental risk management in investment financing. With all these matters, we have achieved active progress in supporting trade in green goods and services. We support the export of uh, 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 green equipment, such as uh, eco-friendly uh, container ships, uh, uh, IRI batteries, PV, and hydropower generating units. We support the import of green equipment with low emissions and low energy consumption, including the wind power generating units and uh, new display module production lines, fostering new energy industries and uh, green transformation and upgrading of the manufacturers industry. We support enterprises in pro uh, providing environmental protection services for overseas customers and in green project contracting. For example, construction the wastewater treatment pipeline networks in Marichus and utilizing the agricultural waste land in Thailand. Now, I'd like to share my comments on how uh, uh, to provide a stronger financial support for the green development. First, uh, strengthen financial cooperation. Achieving green development is a global consensus, but there's a huge funding gap in achieving this goal, which can hardly rely on uh, any single uh, institutions. To this end, we need to fully mobilize different uh, sources of funds, make good use of uh, blended credits, syndicated loan, co-financing, and other forms of financial cooperation, and boost the PPP model so as to create a synergy among various funds raised via uh, multiple channels. Second, introduce uh, innovative financial products and services. In the face of changing green technology and diverse and variable financial needs, financial institutions should keep pace with the changing circumstances and speed up financial innovation and satisfy the needs of the real economy and enterprises for green development with more flexibility and adaptability. Third, expand the scope of support. We, our financial support should be extended from trade in, in green goods and services to other areas, including uh, research and development, production, sales and uh, maintenance, and be delivered to the upstream and downstream of the industrial and supply chains. So as to ensure full coverage of financial support for the green development. So with that, uh, I will conclude my remarks. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this uh, the topic of integration and taking a comprehensive approach uh, is, is coming out very strongly. Um, if I can now turn to our final speaker, um, Katie, um, please, uh, yeah, please take the floor. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you for having me here today. Um, so I'm gonna just jump right in, in the interest of time and start off by exploring what green and trade policies are emerging and what development finance institutes can do to cohere within the broader environment emerging around trade and climate initiatives. There's growing recognition, as many speakers have noted, of the importance of aligning all economic development with climate goals. 
And with shrinking timelines to achieve a two degree future, never mind a 1.5 degree future, it's incumbent on all stakeholders, governments, finance institutions, corporations, multilateral institutions, to tune economic governance to the climate resilient pathways that can mitigate carbon emissions and adapt to irreversible changes in our climactic realities. This has also been the case in trade and investment policy, where there is growing momentum around the need to drive trade towards lower carbon and environmentally friendly goals. This has been articulated across unilateral, bilateral, plurilateral and multilateral spheres. For example, at the unilateral level, we are seeing the discussion around introducing carbon border adjustment mechanisms, effectively a tax on carbon intensity of traded goods, uh, particularly in the European Union, where they're, they're most advanced with this plan. But we've also heard talk of, of CBAMs, carbon border adjustment mechanisms, in the US, Canada, and, and the UK too. At the bilateral level, we've seen non-binding chapters as part of trade agreements for some time on, on environmental uh, ambition, but we're also beginning to see different sorts of cooperation around trade related measures, such as the Green Steel Deal that has been suggested between the US and EU to accelerate trade in steel that follows greener production methods. And we know that steel production contributes 8% of global CO2 emissions. At the plurilateral level, relevant initiatives include the Agreement on Climate Change, Trade and Sustainability, which took place between New Zealand, Costa Rica, Fiji, Iceland, Norway and Switzerland, and was focused around liberalising environmental goods and services and suspending fossil fuel subsidies, but didn't eventually lead to more concrete outcomes. But these conversations has had an impact at the multilateral level. There's increasing dialogue on the connection between trade and climate um, at the WTO, manifesting as the trade and environmental sustainability structured discussions. These uh, cover issues including liberalising environmental goods and services, ending fossil fuel subsidies or inefficient fossil fuel subsidies in their terminology, and supporting circular economy initiatives. Different numbers of members are following these uh, respective discussions which you uh, have to choose to participate in. The emergence of these plurilateral initiatives at the WTO has also led to mention of so-called carbon clubs that could emerge for those countries uh, who opt in, who are interested in agreeing firmer trading terms around these specific areas. And one other development of note that isn't within the trade architecture itself, but is um, fundamental um, as part of the investment architecture is the growing concern with investor state dispute settlement mechanisms, ISDS, which is in thousands of investment treaties and FTAs and its impact on holding back green developmental initiatives or indeed in initiating a policy chill on mitigation plans. The OECD recently hosted a conference looking specifically at the links between climate change and investment protection measures such as this. So what are the challenges and opportunities for DFIs in this space? Across each of these different formations of trade and climate understandings, there are risks to emerging economies in lower income countries. Spillover impacts may include lost revenue from tariffs and exports, challenging regulatory alignments, prolonged disputes and trade wars over emerging initiatives outside of the multilateral space, and risks of a two-tier world or a multipolar world where some are party to enhanced market access agreements, while different blocks emerge that are at odds with one another in the drive to attain supremacy in green supply chains. And this will have a direct bearing on the capacity of a global move towards zero emissions and sufficient adaptation. Fragmentation will likely hinder climate action, not help it. And so looking at how we can best support uh, cooperation uh, globally and multilaterally around these emerging initiatives. A specific concern is that there is a risk um, that runs through all of these emerging trade initiatives that development considerations are not being integrated, specifically the very different economic and social starting point for countries who have not benefited from carbon intensive industrialization and development. And it's important for trade and climate policymakers to make this case, that is to align trade and climate initiatives with the UNF C principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, to tune these initiatives to the different needs of developing countries and to help them achieve their own climate and development goals. 
This will include, for example, proposing a more positive developmental and incentive-based approach to accelerate climate action. For example, rewarding climate milestones with increased preferential market access, expanding policy space in trade and investment rules, whether with tools such as peace clauses or climate waivers, will also be necessary to enable the sort of interventionist industrial policy for mitigation and adaptation that might contravene existing agreements that were never designed with the climate crisis in mind. It'll also include reviving the promises in the UNFCCC technology pillar for technology transfer of low carbon technologies, which means addressing issues and trade rules around intellectual property rules. These initiatives alone, however, will not accelerate sustainable and climate resilient trade, but will depend on adequate, reliable and affordable financing. So again, that importance of linking up the different spheres of global economic governance. So for development finance institutions, then, there are two key priorities I would like to highlight. Firstly, to monitor and prepare for adjustments in trading terms as these initiatives develop further. DFIs should use their analysis, knowledge and expertise to work with countries to prepare for any consequent shocks. This may include moving towards more regional integration strategies and cooperation around climate and development goals, including with the tools of trade. A second priority to highlight is to ensure that they are providing the sort of financing that developing countries need to be able to be competitive in a world of climate action. As these initiatives gather speed, and as long as they continue to diffract member states rather than bring them together, countries will need to access diverse sources of financing to pursue climate resilient development trajectories. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panellists. So much content and um, so little time. So um, I'm afraid we haven't got time for an additional question, but just to um, yeah, sum, sum up um, all of the sessions, I think um, we're seeing a big, uh, both internal and external drivers um, towards taking a more integrated approach um, that links the development and industrial pathways um, with our finance mechanisms we've we've got we um katie a brilliant uh, identifying at the end there a whole number of opportunities um, for alignment and for continuing to take this discussion further. So um, it just remains for me to thank very much UNCTAD for organising this uh, seminar and for all of the speakers who have contributed today. Um, thank you very much.